Good morning and welcome all to day two of Hear Me, See Me, the 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Summit. My name is Sarah Salmon, Senior Research Analyst with the Missouri of the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. My name is Sam Bajak, Senior Research Analyst with the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Sarah and I are co-planners of the event in this year's MCs. We are live via WebEx meeting presenting this year's summit. As is the third year our department has hosted an equity summit, we are delighted that you and almost 400 equity champions joined us again for uh, all over the state of Missouri and the country are with us today. As we kick things off, we'd like to know where you're joining us from. So let's light up the chat box with our first interactive question. What institution or organization are you from? You'll see this question come across the chat. As we watch those responses roll in, maybe you'll see someone you know or someone that you want to connect with. But here's a couple reminders about how to get the most out of this virtual event. Uh, we request that all participants stay muted to eliminate background noise. We would love to see your faces. Uh, if you have a camera, please turn it on so you can better engage with us. All the presentations will be live, so bear with us for any technical issues. Uh, the chat will be monitored for questions throughout the presentations. If you enter a session and you decide that it isn't for you, uh, please close out and head to a different session, just like you would at an in-person conference. All the sessions will be recorded, so you'll be able to access them after the conference. And then don't forget to engage with us on social media throughout the day and throughout the week using the hashtag equity 2021, tagging us at M-O-D-H-E-W-D and exploring our conference website. And now it is my pleasure to welcome my colleagues in the Office of Post-Secondary Policy, Eric Anderson and Sam Bajak. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome this morning. We're so glad you were able to join us. Um, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm the director of college and correctness for the Office of Post-Secondary Policy in the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. I am joined by my colleague, Sam Bajak, who you've gotten to know well already if you've attended the summit yesterday. Uh, he's done a great job him seeing. Uh, it's our pleasure today to present on uh, the findings from our 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Report. Um, as many of you know, we've been, as Sam mentioned, we've been doing these summits now for, for this is our third year. Um, the, this is our third report as well. The first two reports um, were a little bit different. They were, they were uh, more data heavy. They were focused more on quantitative data. Uh, and the first report focused on access and progress. So we looked at um, who's coming into our post-secondary institutions, what do they look like? Do they match the demographic profile of the state? Um, and the second, um, and what their preparation was leading into that. Our second report focused on success and outcomes. So we looked at um, students who were continuing through their educational programs, uh, completing, and we looked at some workforce outcomes as well. What we've seen over those two reports is that persistent gaps um, continue across multiple metrics for certain key demographic populations. Um, no matter what metric we looked at, whether it was um, academic preparation or retention or even workforce outcomes, there were uh, persistent gaps among low-income students, first-generation students, and students of color. Um, this year, our report's been a little bit different. Uh, it's been more uh, qualitative in nature. Um, as you can see on the slide, we, we sent out a survey in the fall of 2020 uh, to our students, asking them some questions about affordability. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to our institutional partners. Um, we were we were able to put together the survey, send it to the institutions, and the institutions were able to disseminate to their students on campus. I mean, the, the survey asked questions about their ability to pay for college, life expenses. Um, you know, what, what they struggle to pay for, what are some things they'd like us to know? And we modeled this largely after the California Student Aid Commission's Student Expense and Resources Survey. Um, as, as Commissioner Mulligan mentioned yesterday, 
We received nearly 10,000 responses from our students statewide. Um, and, and surprising to us, it was a pretty much a representative sample of uh, the Missouri population, especially those that are, are college age, with, with a few exceptions, as we'll touch on later. Um, we, we heard a lot of great responses from students, um, and, and we left some open text boxes so they could let us know exactly what they, what they were feeling. And we realized that we needed to dig into that a little bit more. So we had a series of focus groups that we held as well in uh, the end of April, beginning of May, where we talked to a number of students about and asked them more in depth questions. Um, so just give a rough, rough background on the survey demographics. As I mentioned are the racial demographics mirrored very closely the American community survey data, um, the profile of Missouri, and that comes from uh, US Census data. Uh, Women were actually more likely to respond to this survey than men. We had a 75% response of women compared to 25% men. We know that we know that women are um, more likely to be in higher education than men. Uh, I think it's usually about a 55-45 split, um, but this was much larger than we expected. Uh, and we had a roughly 75-25 split uh, in age categories. So 75 of our 75% of our respondents were. Traditional age students between 18 and 24, um, and 25% were 25 and older. That's that's roughly kind of what we see in our data as well. 75 to 80% of our student population um, are traditional age students in most cases, and about 20% are adult students. Um, we were able to collect some some information that we hadn't had access to before. Uh, so this was really interesting. We we asked students about disability. Uh, almost 14% of students, 13.5% of students said that they had a disability. Uh, we were able to get some other things too, like uh, means tested benefits. Uh, nearly 5% of service respondents res reported as being on SNAP benefits, and 21% reported needing food assistance or receiving food assistance. Um, about one in three students indicated they received a Pell Grant, um, one in five reported having dependents. Or dependent care, so children, or they were caring for for parents or other family members. Uh, about seven percent reported being on either Medicare or Medicaid, uh, and close to twelve percent reported not having health insurance. Um, we also looked at other characteristics as well. So we got the demographic characteristics, we got some of the the benefits, but we also want to look at some other things. We looked at employment. Um, we know that that today's students, many of them are working. Uh, and working quite regularly while they are in school. What we saw about half were employed. Half of the overall respondents were employed um, with one in four uh, working more than one job. When we broke this down by demographic category, we saw that low income students were much more likely to be employed um, than, than their peers and, and low income students we used uh, proxies. So students who received Access Missouri Grants or Pell Grants um, or other uh, sort of benefits, we, we identified them as low income. Uh, so 71% 71, 71 of low income students indicated that they were employed while going to school uh, and low income students and black students were much more likely to be employed full time than, than the rest of the population. Um, we had uh, of our non-white non respondents, um, they were more likely to be adult students than our, our normal population or the, the rest of the population of the, the respondents. A vast majority of students uh, were either always or, or almost always full-time students, and about half of them uh, report at least having one parent who had not completed a college degree. Um, what we heard throughout the, the, the surveys and even the focus groups was that uh, the the impact of COVID-19 was very prevalent. Um, it didn't necessarily impact aid as we had assumed that it would, at least not the students told us, but that it did, in fact, open a lot, a lot of opportunities to go back to school. We heard from a number of students in the survey and the focus groups um, that with the switch to remote learning, it allowed them to be more flexible and, and accessing their materials and taking courses. Um, one student in particular told us that she had not considered going back to school. She had started at one point and then dropped out. Um, and then when COVID hit and she was suddenly at home with her children, uh, she decided, well, I can't do anything else right now. Um, 
let me go back to school. And so she was able to enroll in some courses and and work on a program to uh, finish the degree that she had never uh, that she had started. Uh, we also saw before we move on, we also saw that there's kind of a negative impact of COVID-19 on some students. Uh, we had some students express that they had, they were relying on their parents' income to help supplement um, their expenses, and they had parents who lost jobs during the pandemic, um, some who had shifting hours and so couldn't pay. We also heard from a number of students, uh, especially international students, who have very strict re strict requirements on where they can and can't work while they're enrolled uh, in U.S. institutions. Say that when campus is shut down, the only jobs they can have are on campus positions. And when campus is shut down um, in March 2020, uh, they were unable to find employment elsewhere, and so really had to buckle down and look for other cost saving mechanisms. Next slide, please. Yeah. So overall, over all this data that we looked at, um, the survey responses, the focus groups, uh, the central theme of the of the report of our findings are that affordable affordability issues hit everybody, right? There was not a single demographic group or a single student who said, "Yeah, you know what? I'm I'm able to afford this just fine." All of our respondents, uh, and this could be a selection bias, uh, most of our respondents indicated they struggled to pay. For higher education at some point, but while everybody indicated that they struggled, we did see certain groups persistently um, that were more distinctly disadvantaged than others. Again, these are some of the same um, demographics that we that we've seen in other reports: uh, students of color, working age Missourians, and and low income Missourians. Um, at the same time, though, what what you're going to see throughout this presentation and throughout the report. Is that while students express frustration, there was an overwhelming sense of hope as well that things that these things are tough, that it's difficult to get through and pay for um, college. But ultimately, the students were optimistic that not only would their post secondary education lead to a job, but it would be a better paying job than what many of them currently were were doing or had done prior to starting their programs, but that it would overall improve their overall quality of life. So this is the first finding from the survey that we wanted to highlight for this morning's presentation. What you're looking at across the bottom of the chart are a series of fields that students were asked to evaluate how big of a burden each of those categories were to them. They were able to rank them one, meaning most burdensome, to eight, not applicable or not burdensome at all. And this is the percentage breakdown of the amount of one responses or the amount of this is the most burdensome to me. And as you can see, uh, cost of college overwhelmingly was given the most one responses that students consistently cited. This is the biggest obstacle to my ability to flourish in college and nothing else really comes close. The next, the second most amount of one responses is balancing school and work responsibilities at slightly less than 20%. And we wanted to highlight, we'll be highlighting some quotes from both the focus groups as well as the open response section of the survey um, so that folks can get a little bit more of that human element of what the students were reporting. And we'll talk a little bit about the frustrations that many students voiced in regards to fees, feeling as though when they got their bills, they were feeling either nickel and dime or they didn't understand why they were being charged with the things that they were being charged with, um, lack of clarity in some in some instances, um, and occasionally bad advice that we see from this student quote, I was depleted of all my savings through my advisor who was new and misinformed with me fatally. They're a lot of these students, they're relying on the input that they get from um, their leadership structures and the folks that are in the offices designed to help them. Well, what do they do when you have situations like this student who was negatively materially impacted by, um, by that advice? And here we see again the same concerns around fees, wondering where the fees are coming from, why am I being charged with fees for services that I'm not using or rarely using. 
and we just wanted to take a moment to highlight some of these some of these student concerns because this was a rather common refrain in both the open response in the survey as well as the focus groups that this was a a precise location of student frustration. We also wanted to uh, highlight this quote from a student who was citing difficulties with their financial aid due to um, the inaction of an absent parent. And at, at the end of this quote, you see, I just hate to think that there are households out there who don't have savings accounts or a grandparent to fall back on. My academics were threatened by a factor I couldn't control. This, like, this is the real life lived experience of many of these students um, as they navigate the complexities that is higher higher education and figuring out how to pay for it. Back to the data of the survey, um, we captured a good amount of information regarding food insecurity. Respondents were asked to evaluate how true certain statements were to their personal lives, and the three prompts you see on the right, um, students were given the option to answer never true, sometimes true, or often true. And these figures are the aggregated amount of often true and sometimes true. Um, for I was worried whether my food would run out. I couldn't afford to eat balanced meals. The food that I bought just didn't last. I didn't have money to get more. It's it's kind of uh, jarring when it when it's put this way. And we have a few more quotes that we wanted to highlight. One from a student who relied on work to get their food supply. They cited trying to drink coffee when they weren't working so that they could trick their bodies into thinking that they were full. And another student citing frustrations with feeling that their meal plan was insufficient to adequately feed them and give them the energy they felt they needed to do their classwork and do their, their work work as well. Um, and here is the demographic breakdown of uh, student dis uh, food insecurity by race, eth ethnicity, and income proxies and disability. Um, we see that Missourians on SNAP benefits, Missourians with disabilities, um, Missourians uh, that were either Pell and Access Missouri grants, as well as uh, Black Missourians, are typical are particularly overrepresented in, among folks that were that reported from the survey that they were dealing with food insecurity. Now, this next section requires a little bit of upfront definition so that you know what exactly we mean when we say unmet need. The six categories you see across the bottom of the chart were aspects of life that students were asked to self evaluate their ability to adequately pay. And it was a Likert scale ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Uh, with somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, and a neutral option in the middle if they weren't sure how to respond. So if a student responded somewhat disagree, strongly disagree, they were put in this unmet need category. And this is the breakdown of students that were deemed as having unmet need across categories. And as you can see, it's tuition and fees and books and supplies that uh, overwhelmingly appear to be burdening students the most. And one of the other things we wanted to mention is we didn't include the neither agree nor disagree percentages in these totals, which we and that was a topic of discussion for us. If students are un if they're unsure about their ability to pay for these things, how do we at how do how do we adequately tell their story? So I just wanted to make a note of that. Well they may not be reflected in this particular metric that we wanted to show um, that the reality is quite complicated. And if we did include that middle ambiguous, I'm not really sure how to how to respond to this, all of these percentages across the category across all six categories would be 15 to 20 percent higher. And here are the uh, population breakdowns of this unmet need category by uh, race and ethnicity. Um, as you can see, our data shows that it's black Missourians and 
Missourians of Alaskan and indigenous backgrounds that struggle a little bit more with these issues. But again, going back to our central thesis statement, this affects everybody. This is making everybody's lives miserable or they're seeing people in their immediate circle whose lives are being made miserable as a result of having difficulties paying for college. And that was a refrain that we saw even from the survey responses that had positive things to say, whether by virtue of having a scholarship or um, being lucky with per with uh, parent situations, even for those students, a lot of them went out of their way to say, I recognize how lucky I am. I know that my situation is not the norm. So continuing on this unmet need, uh, category 18% of students reporting having unmet needs self-identified as having a disability. This is an over-representation by about five or six percent. Um, 8.8 percent of students with unmet need are on SNAP benefits. That's almost double the percentage of SNAP recipients for the survey population overall. Uh, over half of students that fell into this unmet need category are either Pell Grant recipients or Access Missouri Grant recipients. Uh, roughly a third of students reporting having unmet need are working age Missourians between the ages of 25 and 64. And the overwhelming majority, 90.5% of students that were in this unmet need category reported being on some form of financial aid. And I, I just want to hammer home again. There is a whole other section of students that for precision's sake, we decided to not include in this data analysis that responded to these prompts with a kind of ambiguous, I don't know how to accurately self-assess these things. And if we had included them, these percentages would be quite a bit higher. So I'm gonna pass the presentation back to Eric to close things off with some of, a few more of the voices we heard from students, some of the frustrations that they voiced to us when we asked them to, to share their stories, but also some of the hopes that Eric mentioned earlier, that this is not, despite what the data, despite what we're talking about with this data, this is not bleak, this is not hopeless, this is fixable. And we think that the students have that same sense. So I'll, I'll pass this back to Eric. Thanks, Sam. Um, this quote right here is from a, a focus group participant. Um, and I'll let you guys guys read it. But I think this this really uh, reiterates something we heard in the legislative panel yesterday. Um, yesterday, towards the end of the the first day, was that you know there there's this prevalent idea, or used to be this idea that that students could work over the summer, or work a part time job over the summer, and then uh, be able to pay for school. And we heard we heard many of the legislators yesterday uh, express this idea that that's an outdated model. Um, and our students face this kind of um, discussion point regularly, right? Th this student in particular, um, this was our last focus group, um, and she had asked, "Okay, so you know, th th this focus group has been great, but what what are you guys going to do with this information?" And we told her and, and the others in the focus group that we were going to put together a report. We were going to present um, at an equity summit that we we're going to hold in October. It's like that—that's fantastic. We really need—we really need this kind of information. We really need um, to share this with people. And then this, <laughs> and then she tells us this story right here. And we thought it was just so impactful that we wanted to share it. Um, interestingly enough, well, we, again, what we heard from the survey and the focus groups was that students are busy, right? Like they can't just work part-time jobs over the summer. They have to work jobs while they're employed. Many of them, one in four, one in five, have children. Or other depends they have to take care of. There are lots of other responsibilities. Uh, a lot of the scholarships that students are on, and you can kind of see this throughout the report as we shared some quotes, have very strict um, GPA requirements. So they have to really focus and study hard to maintain their their scholarships. Um, and what we saw really is that like this is, and I hate to overuse this analogy, but this is a finely balanced house of cards, right? Uh, students are going to school and everything is just finally balanced. And if there's one thing that disturbs that balance, it all just comes crashing down. And oftentimes we lose students for that very reason. It could be a, uh, a car repair. It could be an illness. It could be any number of things. Um, 
we had we had asked students if they wanted to come and participate in the panel, and many of them said yes, absolutely, this would be great. Uh, but then we reached out to them; they all told us unsurprisingly, we're actually very busy and we can't do this. We've got work and classes and stuff. Um, and so I think that just kind of reiterates the point that that they're willing to help out and they lent us their voices, um, but they're also under a lot of constraints. Sam, the next slide, and we'll kind of round this out. Um, there are also a lot of, like I said, there are a lot of voices of hope. Right, that the struggle was was difficult, but at the end, they believed that it was going to be worth it. Um, that this investment, both time and resources, was going to be worth it, and not just for a better paying job, but for a better quality of job and a better quality of life. Um, as this one student says, you know, the struggle is to make a better life for their family is ultimately what they want to do. Um, they're at a point where where they felt like this is the next step. Um, next slide, Sam. Um, again, we heard from a lot of a lot of students who are parents, and I think this this quote really just kind of kicks it off. Like this was a way for for this student to invest in herself. She had given a lot of time to her children. She gave a lot of time to her employer, and this was an opportunity for her to go to school and invest in herself, um, and create that better life for herself that we wanted. Um, I encourage all of you to to look at the report. Uh, it's posted online. I believe Sarah put it in the chat. Uh, again, what what struck us was a lot of a lot of frustration. Uh, I think we heard that too yesterday um, from the different panelists and the different speakers. But ultimately, there is a lot of hope, uh, and I hope that we as stakeholders can can get together and figure out what are some of these supports that we can help students, so that one little thing, one little disruption in that balance is not enough to throw it all away, or or to set them back um, quite a bit. Um, here are our contact, our emails. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and Sarah, I don't know if we have time for questions, but but I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, if you want to open it up for a few questions, we have three minutes. If anyone has questions you want to put in the chat for Eric and Sam. Well, if not, that's okay. Um, Eric and Sam have done an amazing job and this whole summit, the whole theme, Hear Me, See Me, is based off of these student stories and student um, surveys that we received, just some really amazing content. And, you know, it's a little bit different approach this year. Um, and it just really, really hits the heart of why we do this work. So thank you, Sam and Eric, for all of your hard work, putting all of this together. and. Um, you know, I think it's really going to make a difference in how we all see. Hear and see our students, so thank you.